When those pesky Republic walkers and gunships pose a threat from the air or from the ground, look no further than the reliable and powerful J-1 semi-autonomous proton cannon for your defense. What's up, meta nerds? Today we'll be exploring the specs, stats, and history of the Separatist J-1 to see what made it such a formidable field artillery piece for the CIS. We'll use both legends and canon sources to construct a full picture of it, and you'll see why Republic officers were so weary of this weapon's deadly firepower. CIS commanders had a wide variety of weapon systems at their disposal, covering all manner of engagement ranges and requirements. Confederate armor, AATs, NRN99 snail tanks, and IG-227 hailfires tended to steal the glory in offensive operations, hovering, treading, and rolling forward to crush Loyalist positions. However, when pushed onto the defensive, SEPI officers knew they could rely on the J-1. It squatted down on four crab-like legs, which bowed inward to form the center mounting for a thick cannon assembly. A wide, stubby barrel protruded from the cannon housing, roofed with curving armor plates while an operational control chair jutted out to the left side of the vehicle. With its stout, bug-like appearance, the J-1 appeared every bit the product of the insectoid engineers that the CIS favored, from the Geonosians to the Colicoids. But it was actually produced by the Gumby folks over at the Techno Union, and was an integral part of the industrial conglomerate's contribution to the Separatist Alliance, and would be licensed to be built in factories across the galaxy as the CIS war effort intensified. The J-1, while technically self-propelled, was quite slow to move and repossession. The J-1's leg assemblies could shuffle to align the cannon housing, elevating to engage aerial targets or repositioning to gain a better shot, although this process was very slow and deliberate. Tactical or operational mobility was not a necessity, however, as the J-1 was a field artillery piece designed to function in a defensive role, not to be moving quickly with armored columns like the tanks mentioned before. It did fill a dual role of anti-tank and anti-aircraft artillery, equally capable of blasting Republic tanks on the ground or gunships in the sky, and at major Separatist installations, such as the Shield Generator Spire for Poggle the Lesser's Foundry on Geonosis, or the Occupied Anaxis Assembly Complex, these locations were studded with these gun positions, providing solid all-around defense. J-1s had long range and powerful shells, allowing them to pick off attackers at a distance of several miles before they could close in. On Ryloth, the J-1 battery drove off incoming Republic acclimators and shot down multiple 212th gunships en route to liberate the town of Nabat, while dozens of Republic gunships went down in flames over the Geonosian Desert, in one of the most infamous air assaults of the entire war in the second invasion of Geonosis. And while powerful, the J-1s had a slow rate of fire, limited by their firing mechanism. The proton shells were manually loaded by labor droids into the breech loading chamber, firing one round before reloading. Typically, this was not an issue when firing as a part of a battery, especially at long range, but in close quarters, this reload speed limited the J-1's ability to quickly knock out one target after another. In battle, they were best used as a part of a multi-layered network of defenses, in some ways similar to the old firing lines of early rifles, where you could make up for lack of speed by volume and staggering them, with the J-1 dug in and picking off targets at long range, with DSD-1 dwarf spiders putting up a rapid, short-range anti-aircraft flak screen and hopefully having other pieces filling in the medium range. And we see this in the Second Battle of Geonosis, where they were used in a multi-layered defense along with Geonosian sonic cannons and Nantex fighters, making the skies a very lethal place for Republic craft. Sonic cannons also complemented the J-1's on Poggle shield generator outpost, covering that medium range, while J-10 dual blaster cannons engaged infantry, allowing the artillery to focus more on armored targets. If they needed to, J-1s could be used against infantry at point-blank range, but their effectiveness was limited, and alone they tended to fall prey to enemy units that got close. Y-wings that penetrated the anti-aircraft screen at the assembly complex and on Geonosis would come in for screaming dive-bombing runs, too fast and at too steep of an angle for the J-1s to track. They probably would have done the same against the J-1 battery at Nabat, if not for the Republic's reluctance to wipe out the entire village in the process. J-1s were likely protected against shell fragments and small arms, with that light armor plating on the side, but it could be easily taken out by enemy tanks. And it didn't appear to be hardened against EMP attacks either, with even handheld droid poppers being able to temporarily scramble their scanners. Like all vehicles, J-1s could be vulnerable, but when properly employed and supported, it did form a vital part of the Confederate officer's defensive screen. And as for that semi-autonomous part of the name, this came from the J-1's optionally manned nature. A gunner, whether they be droid or organic, could sit in the left side mounted gunner's chair, with a targeting panel that would display all the important information needed. Range to target, shell type, firing solution, etc. However, the cannon came with a built-in droid brain enabling it to function independently if desired. 
So though not looking like a B1 or B2 battle droid, this, just like the fighters and other tanks, is a droid unit. Separatist commanders could have the option to slave circuit all J1 batteries in a sector to a certain target, giving better top-down control. However, it has been noted in the galaxy far, far away that totally automated gunnery tends to be predictable and less accurate. So having a gunner when possible was preferred in most situations. That droid brain is fed data via these two large photoreceptor eyes, located right below the main gun and enabling it to form its own firing solutions. With a confirmed height of 6.5 meters and about 6 meters long and wide, for the body, not including the gun barrel, the J1 would be about four standard American bathtubs laid end to end or a common giraffe reclining long ways, while being about a third shorter than the AAT, or half the size of a Republic ATTE, giving this stout vehicle lots of places to position itself in town squares, alleys, or atop properly reinforced buildings. J1s were also seen as a part of the port and starboard armament of some Separatist warships, such as the Munificent Class Frigate or Providence Class Carrier Destroyer. Here, these guns were fed with a magazine-type ammunition rack, giving these guns a much faster rate of fire, and bolted directly to the deck, with firepower able to engage shielded capital ships, albeit as a secondary or even tertiary armament. So knowing it was packing that kind of firepower, it's no wonder the J-1 could blow LAATs to smithereens, and could paralyze if not completely destroy ATTEs and saber tanks, and even documented cases of them taking down larger ATHEs and juggernauts as well. That's it for the breakdown, and as for some cool facts and behind the scenes stuff, let's thank our sponsor Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. In 2020, there were 5 million crashes reported. That's 15,000 a day or 600 an hour, and most people think it's way too complicated to get any lawyer to represent them. Morgan & Morgan wants to change that, modernizing the whole profession and bringing it into the 21st century. If you get their app, you can submit everything you need in just 8 clicks or less, all from the comfort of your couch. For more information, go to ForThePeople.com or dial pound L-A-W, pound law, that's pound 529 for more information. And be sure to check out Morgan & Morgan, they have 24-7 support ready to help. The J-1s are similar to the high caliber flak guns of World War II, such as the German Flak 88. But the Flak 88 was powerful and long range, used to pick off Allied bombers flying over Germany, slowly firing heavy flak shells which could reach high altitudes. Like the J-1, the Flak 88 also was pressed into an anti-tank role, able to pierce most Allied tank armor with a single shot. Allied tanks learned to fear the 88 in open plains, where the German cannon could knock out Allied armor at long range before they could even close the distance. And just like we saw with the Seps, in close quarters the 88 was easy prey. And they even share similar anti-aircraft tactics, with rapid-fire 20mm and slower 37mm anti-aircraft guns, and slower 37mm AA guns covering those close to medium range, while the 88 picked off targets from afar, like we see with the J-1s and dwarf spiders working together. The J-1s can be seen in LEGO Star Wars The Clone Wars 3's Battlefield mode, and has been made into many LEGO sets, both official and man-made. Please hit that like button, it's the best way to help me out. But most important of all, remember, you're not getting any reinforcements until those guns are out of commission. And the force will be with you. Always.